Hi, everyone. Welcome to H and Powerhouse, Twitter and podcast session. May we also follow H and Powerhouse on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Uh, as we discuss all things Web3, we have a focus on topics surrounding women and Asians in the space. I'm Joy Seung. I'm a photographer, film producer, and podcaster. And uh, co-hosting with me is Nicole Yap, founder of HN, beautiful NFT collection with the artwork by Mr. Hike, celebrating diversity and female empowerment while focusing on building community. Well, thanks for joining us. Our special guest today is Sylvia Kwan, actress, star of Grey's Anatomy and movie List of the Lifetime, champion of Asian American representation. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our podcast. Hey, Sylvia. Hey, Joy. Yeah, so my name is Nicole. I'm the founder of an NFT project called Asian, and our goal is to empower more women in the space, in the Web3 space, at the same time to showcase the rich and beautiful Asian heritage and cultures that we have. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Sylvia. You're, maybe you can start off with just the background and your journey in acting. I understand you started in theater and gone into TV and film, so it'd be great to hear about that journey. Thanks so much for having me here. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to be on. Yeah, I started doing a lot of theater in actually California as well as Alaska. Um, I did that for years and then I started working more and more in film and TV. And then I started booking Grey's Anatomy as well as, as you mentioned, List of a Lifetime. And you start off with theater. Can you talk a little bit about the transition between theater and TV as well? Yeah, it's very interesting because it was actually not just a transition in form in terms of art form, but it was also a transition in terms of lifestyle. For theater in general, you know, you can work in theater in Los Angeles, where I am right now. Um, and I did. But when I was working out of state, I was constantly away from home for months at a time. And you have kind of a three week rehearsal process and then you start the run of the show and it usually lasts for one to two months. So you're gone for a lot. It was a really incredible experience because I I got to travel and I got to really learn what it was like to live in different places. And so when I transitioned to TV and film, I was much more rooted in Los Angeles. And we shoot Grey's Anatomy here in Los Angeles. And I also shot List of a Lifetime here. So in terms of traveling, I wasn't traveling as much as I used to. So that was an adjustment as well as translating the form of acting from theater acting into film and TV. So it was a really interesting change. It was a, an exciting challenge. I loved it. I still would love to do theater in the future, just depending on what my schedule is like, because they are two different art forms and the skills that you have to use for each are similar and different. It's pretty exciting to be able to do both. Awesome. Yeah, totally. I mean, I can see the different skill sets needed for both, right? And how, what got you into acting in the first place? Did you always know as a kid? Yeah. How did you kind of continue to pursue that? So I'm from Virginia, and I remember when I was a kid, my dad showed me the film West Side Story, and I loved it, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Kind of growing up, I, it wasn't necessarily a reality. I went to university, and I majored in something else, but I had always done local theater, community theater. I had done the shows at the university, and so when I graduated, I decided, okay, this is, I'm going to try it. I think I said, I'm going to try it for a year, which is just unrealistic if you want to build a career. But, you know, that first year kept me going, kind of. I think every time I wanted, you know, I was unsure of what I was doing or, you know, I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. Something happened that kept me going or, you know, I took a really exciting acting class or I booked a really great show and I and loved it all over again. Interestingly enough, I was at, at an event a few months ago and I actually got to meet Rita Moreno, who is the star of West Side Story. And I got the experience to tell her, you know, you were one of my biggest inspirations. Like you made me want to become an actress. It just kind of made me feel like just very grateful to be where I am right now. That is amazing. <laughs> Definitely makes you feel like it's full circle too, right? And yeah. Like, okay, sure. I'm glad I stuck with it. <laughs> And, and it's a long journey, uh, I'm sure. And, and any, you know, any type of creatives or freelancing, starting your own business, these are all in the category of just kind of lots of ups and downs. Is there a, a hardest time or hardest road that you had, a, a role to ha you had to play um, along the way that make you feel like, oh, maybe this is not for me? Or is that kind of every audition? You know, <laughs> that's such a good question. It's funny because I think it's when you're not working that that's when you feel like, oh, man, I made a mistake. You know, I shouldn't hear... I think in terms of the roles that I've gotten to play, I've been very, very fortunate. We recently did on Grey's Anatomy an episode about Asian hate. That was actually a very, very difficult scene for me to film because it's obviously very personal. It's very emotional, but you know you're doing it for another purpose. You're doing it to bring awareness. You're doing it so people can understand what it's like to be an Asian American and experiencing this going on in our country. And so that to me was worth it to be seen and to be heard that way. So that kind of work for me is very fulfilling. And that actually is what keeps me going when people say, when I saw that, it made me feel things. You know, I felt seen. I felt like 
I had a voice. I was also on a show called Viet Gone, and it was about Vietnamese refugees. And it was in the same vein where I felt like, okay, I'm giving voice to people in my community that may not have had the opportunity before. I'm giving people the opportunity to see themselves reflected in these characters. And so those are the things that keep me going in terms of finding meaning in my work as well as creativity in my work. When you're sitting at home waiting for an audition mm -hmm. or, you know, when I was working, you know, all these other jobs that weren't pertaining to acting. And I was like, man, am I, am I still pursuing this? You know, am I just really delusional? Those are the hard times, but you also find different people, different experiences that can fulfill you in different ways as well to kind of keep you going, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It totally makes sense. Every year or every few years, it kind of changes, right? And especially in terms of the Asian and Asian American representation, what the audience like to see and what TV and film would like to produce as well. So it is quite interesting to see the change in landscape. And as I said, I'm sure very fulfilling to be able to play those better represent and be able to also represent the others, right? Can you speak a bit more about that, the before and the now and the future of what you think is going to be represented in entertainment? Gosh, it's funny because it really makes me think of the quote that Gemma Chan said when her dad said something along the lines of, you know, you don't see people that look like us on the big screen. And she said to her dad, I just want to be part of the change. And that really stuck with me because I believe in that so much. Like it's such an exciting time for us with everything everywhere all at once, with Shang-Chi, with Crazy Rich Asians you feel this plethora of emotions as you watch your scene represented on screen in all these different ways, right? So it gives me a lot of hope to see not only the increase in number of films, but also the diversity within those films themselves, right? I'm very, very grateful to the people that helped to open these doors, like Kelly Hu, who I started List of a Life with. You know, I watched her growing up and she was such an example for me. And, you know, she definitely gave me hope because I was like, oh, there's someone that looks like me on TV. So to be able to work with her, such an honor. You know, Sandra Oh, who I haven't met, but she obviously was on Grey's Anatomy. She's one of my favorite actresses. I am probably biased, but <laughs> she's amazing. You know. I'm just so grateful to all these people that have opened doors, to the people that continue to open doors. And I think there's such this, you know, not only increase in movies, but also an increase in collaboration and of Asians uniting in order to increase representation for all of us and also representation for other marginalized communities. If there's anything that I can do to increase representation, like, you know, support Indigenous artists, support the trans community, I think we all have to be allies to one another in order so we can all rise, if that makes sense. Absolutely. see a lot of uh, change in these few years and uh, in a positive way. So um, as you said, not just in one particular community, but being allies to each other. Um, so that's super exciting. And do you feel like you feel the change with everyone like around you and from, you know, communities that are obviously not Asian, but like other population or other allies over the past few years? Yeah, I definitely see an increase in visibility. I see an increase in hopefully opportunity, even, you know, just TV shows like Reservation Dogs, which is one of my favorite shows. That's so exciting to me because it's an all Indigenous cast, you know, and, and there's such great actors and actresses and their storylines are so true to who they are. That kind of really excites me. That gives me hope. There have been projects in the past as well within all different communities that have increased representation little by little. But I do think and hope that representation is more at the forefront of people's minds and that these projects will be greenlit going forward. And I hope that it's not just simply checking off a box. Like, I, I really think people are starting to delve into how do we create representation for different communities in an accurate way, in ways that um, people are allowed to have their own, people are allowed to represent their culture and who they are, and also not be seen as representative of their entire community. I think that these conversations are happening, you know, in social media, like very much like what we're, do we're doing right now, right? I think that's exciting. I hope that there's more awareness being brought out. I hope that people are having just more in-depth conversations about what is being put out there, what they would like to see, what does fulfill them, because I think that's a very important step in terms of representation of just saying, hey, well, you know, we have different people on the screen, but like, you know, might not be represented in a very holistic way, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, like I want people to be able to represent the entire spectrum of their humanity and not just as a stereotype. Absolutely. Kind of just a yeah. universal theme, right? Of like just stories that happen to people <laughs> amplifies certain stereotype, but really just the person. They have these stories of a family or friends and just how, how they deal with life, right? And everyone in all walks of life. Definitely looking forward to see see more of that. I mean, speaking of representation, you know, the Web3 space, definitely breaking that barrier as well. Or, I mean, it started off a bit more niche, uh, but I think now it definitely provides a platform for female um, going into the space and, and being able to merge technology and, and art and uh, also for Asians. I mean, maybe I'll pass it to Nicole to speak of that. And Nicole started a collection in November last year and did an amazing job. 
Yeah, this is really exciting. I heard about Web3. I always get really excited whenever I hear about Web3. But going back to Sylvia, I feel that I feel the same way too. I do notice that in the film industry, Asians are the minority. Even every time when I watch like all the award shows and stuff like that. So every time whenever I see an Asian uh, representation getting an award, I just feel so, you know, really proud because I'm an Asian myself. Yeah, so I would say that even in the Web3 space, that is how I felt as well. Because back then, there weren't a lot of Asian NFT projects out there and we were one of the first Asian women NFTs so that was really really exciting so this is why we had a lot of supporters supporting our project one of them is a really famous DJ Steve Aoki I'm not sure if you know him so he was our huge supporter and I would say he contributed to the exposure of our brand in the west because for myself I'm from Malaysia and when I started this it was really hard for me to find that connection as the whole web3 space and the NFT space was really concentrated in the west so having his support was really huge for us and that thing that I still can't believe that he, you know, he actually bought our NFT project. I have a question. So have you heard about like the Web3 space? Are you into NFTs? Do you hold like cryptocurrencies? You know, what are your thoughts about it? So first, it's so fascinating to me and I applaud you for creating this community because I completely understand how you feel when you say you felt very isolated or there wasn't as many Asians in this space. I think so great what you guys have done. I have no experience in this whatsoever, but I am completely fascinated by it. And I do feel that this is kind of this new exciting era of, you know, everything is kind of moving to digital so it makes sense with things like NFTs that it's moving, you know, that it's creating art in a digital space as well. I'd love to learn more. I, I really don't know that much about it. And actually just talking to you guys has, has really taught me a lot. But yeah, it's it's fading. And I applaud you for creating community already in this, in this kind of digital world. That's so exciting. You know, I would love to talk to you more about it get you get you in the space yeah because this whole thing is really exciting you being in the film industry i do read a lot of articles hearing that there's a lot of film, film production houses they're actually looking at least to kind of put their clips in the form of digital form into nft so that is something really exciting as well you know you never know next time maybe one of your film could be a part of an episode in an nft that is the future yeah I'm, i'll be happy to talk to you offline to talk more about the space yeah i would love that i think it's fascinating that, I mean, you were figuring it out along with everyone else, right? Like you were figuring out as you went along because yes, this was, yeah, that's fascinating. Because this space is so new, you know? So yeah, it's really funny because there is other NFT project that actually has Asian trade, but they will kind of put like a Japanese flag on like a headband and they'll just call that Asian. I mean, Asian traits. And to me, it's not Asia. You know, Asia is huge. We have a lot of different cultures. We have a lot of the times, even people do confuse like traits like the Korean and the Japanese. They, they feel that it's the same and we all eat new noodles and stuff like that <laughs> so, so that is something that I want to educate about people that you know the Korean and the Japanese we do look the same but we're not the same we don't speak the same language uh you know like there was a few times when I when I when I speak to other people uh when I told them that I was Malaysian Chinese and they'll be like oh but Japanese right and I was like no <laughs> yeah like, it's not the same thing <laughs> yeah it's not the same thing <laughs> Yeah. But it's really cute, you know, it's just it's just really cute. That is something that I that I want to change is to kind of educate people about like the Asian coaches and the different uh you know, the beautiful traditions that we have. This is why our NFT we we have a lot of different colors as well and yeah, just be a lot of traditional costumes to really showcase that. Very cool. I love how you're calling it cute, right? That's it's like oh, that's cute. <laughs> but we don't we don't speak the same language in all Asia. But that, yeah, I mean that goes back to what Sylvia were talking about, right? Just now that there's more content and representation so hopefully there's different you know, nuance for each group to be able to be represented right it's not just a pan-asian like all groups does the same right uh, all kind of look similar yeah, right? we all, yeah um, they're like oh don't you guys all eat noodles <laughs> and dumplings <laughs> i was like no we have rice <laughs> <laughs> That's so, funny. so we do but there's like 100 types of noodles right so but yeah no totally so i mean being able to represent that and and yeah nicole's collection is amazing if you kind of look through and this sub here and um, this different profile pic uh, just elements of different asian countries with clothing the headdress uh, you know so i'm a too i'm a holder of, of our nft and just amazing to see all the combinations and being able to uh, to kind of say oh there's quite a few culture mixed into this particular representation so i think that's interesting because you know my partner and i do film and tv and content producing and it's just always kind of you know mixing in universal theme but also uh being able to bring out kind of you know the realistic version of asian representation so i think we're all you know looking to uh, be the advocate for the representation 
representation, uh, whether it's you know Asian, Asian American, or female in our case as well, and push that forward. I mean, Silver, coming back, I mean, do you do you have any? Is there any particular acting role that's like the most challenging that you can speak to, and how you kind of overcome that? Whether it's like you didn't really like the part, but you had to do it anyway, or it's just a really challenging role. Gosh, I mean, I think there's always you know there's always parts. I've been very very lucky where I, <laughs> I think I like a lot of the part that I got. I think there's definitely times in any kind of career that you have to take roles because you either need the money, you got to pay rent. I think the key to that is still bringing as much humanity into each role as you possibly can. I think, you know, they're especially based on the opportunities that we're afforded as Asian Americans. It can be an internal struggle sometimes whether or not you take certain roles because you may or may not agree with the role itself, but you also want to get to a place where you can start doing roles that you believe in, right? And how you get to that place without having roles before that. So I think it's all about how do I bring humanity to each and every character? How do I bring, as you said, nuance to each and every character? And I think also just knowing that, you know, it's a job. I love acting, but at the end of the day, it's a job. There are a lot of things about the career that are very difficult, about the lifestyle that's difficult. And I think you have to keep coming back to why you're doing this. And for me, it comes back to the meaning that I find behind it and the happiness it brings me. The meaning, I think I've touched on it before. It's about, you know, increasing this visibility in terms of, you know, reaching other people and reflecting their experiences and their emotions back to them. And in terms of just the happiness, I I just love acting. And so I think that is what has, those things have kept me going during the times when like, like, man, I I don't know if I, I don't know how I feel about this. (laughs) You know what I mean? Definitely. Constant roller coaster. But you're right, like definitely keeping in mind that two things that you mentioned, or just kind of generally, that's your happiness. And that's what you feel best doing. At least you get a larger percentage of them that you like, right? Versus those you don't really want to do, then you're, it's already a win. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel also like, you know, this, gosh, this industry is so difficult. If it's not fun, if it doesn't fulfill your soul, if it doesn't make you happy, I don't think I would have lasted this long if it didn't do all those things because it's so difficult. That's really interesting. I mean, I've I've never really thought about like the day-to-day life um, of an actor. Like, what is your schedule like? Like, do you even have time for yourself? I mean, it really depends on if I'm shooting something. And it's actually been interesting because I think the journey that I'm on right now is when I wasn't actively on set, I used to be always hustling and panicking and being like, okay, well, what's the next job? What's the next? It, that to me is not sustainable. And I've learned to really just try to relax. Like when I do have time for myself, you know, I love cooking. So those are the things that I try to do when I'm not working because when I am, it is busy. <laughs> And so your day to day can really change whether or not you're going to set, whether or not you're, you know, working on audition, taping an audition, all of those things, whether or not you're getting your headshots or updating your website. There's so many different aspects that are tied into your career. Every day is very different. But I find that now when I do have time off, I really, really try to sink into it. I try to see people that I love. I'm essentially kind of filling my cup so that when I do go back to work, I'm ready, energized, I'm motivated, all of those things. Yeah, with with um, or in the entertainment industry is either really busy, right, for a short period of time, and then you kind of have some time off, and then just got really busy, right. So you, I guess you have to get into the rhythm and, and find that uh, routine. I mean, what is the downtime usually? Is it in between like a few months, and then you get back onto another project? I mean, I think it just really depends, you know, because I think with the TV schedule, it's kind of like school in the states where it starts in the fall and kind of ends in the spring, and you have hiatus over the summer. But there's also different shows that you can do, you know, like I did a reading last year at La Jolla theater during so I was in San Diego for like a week or so doing a reading you know there's auditions going on and and I think especially now that um, more TV and film is moved you know there's a lot of different uh, streaming services so that full of fall and spring is is changing as well it's kind of all over the place. I have more downtime now because we're on hiatus for Grey's Anatomy. And so I'm taking that, but I'm still busy and doing things, just not to the same degree as when I was shooting as well. And so, and also, you know, different opportunities come up. And so I think that's why, like, it was a big lesson to me that, you know, you could be doing a project next week somewhere. So if you have a day off, do things that really help you in terms of self-care. I think that's been a really big lesson to me. But yeah, the, the kind of schedule is kind of all over the place and, and kind of crazy. But it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. And what's the most fun part then? Oh my gosh. I think it's being on set or being on the stage and getting to play and just be different people. And you're like, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this, right? This is awesome. Like I get to pretend to be a doctor. You know, we got to learn how to suture. That was really cool. We were suturing up bananas. You know, when I'm doing theater, if I'm in a huge fight scene, that's always fun. All these incredible things that you get to learn and do as an actor. And I think also the people that 
you meet along the way. I mean, I've met so many of my close friends from all these different jobs that I've done from all these different shows, and they really change your life, especially like, you know, me and Kelly, who got really, really close from List of a Lifetime, especially because it was such a crazy experience. We were filming during the pandemic. So we had really, really strict regulations. We were getting tested all the time. You know, we had masks and those shields and everything. And that really bonded us because it was such a unique experience. When I was in Alaska doing theater, I got to, you know, it was really like an artist residency because my job was to work on acting. And so I would hike during the day. I would do aerial silks, train with my buddies, and then I would do the show at night. And so I was fulfilled in so many different ways while being in this gorgeous setting of Alaska. Man, I mean, I could go on forever. I'll stop. <laughs> but there's so many incredible things that I've been lucky enough to experience that I'm just I'm just so grateful and happy to be where I am today. That's amazing. And and your passion definitely shows. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can definitely yeah, tell. Started. <laughs> I feel that every one of us, we should definitely find something that we love doing. You know, even if you're not making money, but the fact that we are happy doing it, that is what I stand for, you know. And even with Asian, because before this, I actually own a bubble tea store. So we have like 13 outlets in Malaysia and stuff like that. And after I, I started Asian, I sold off the company. It's not because it wasn't profitable. It's because I wanted to give this a go. And I feel that if I were to balance both things, I won't be able to focus on doing something that I like, like full heart. So yeah, I can definitely relate on that. And I do see that you have a passion each time you talk about like your work. It's really uplifting to see the energy from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Also, I just want to say it's so cool that you were able to pivot to different things. Like how did you have the courage or did was there courage even involved or were you just very, you just knew that this is what you wanted to do? Were you nervous or what was that? process like yeah so i would say that because i was in the crypto scene for close to 10 years actually i i found out about cryptocurrency when i was still in high school and i was so intrigued by the space because that is where i managed to kind of i mean at 16 years old i was able to buy like my first chanel bag and that was like the starting point of my crypto journey i was like wow you know this this thing is amazing and later on i found out you know other than making money and losing money there is this whole like blockchain technology behind it that is really interesting and this is the future and then the nft market started blooming i was in the space and i found out that it was really male dominated there was a lot of nft projects that was just like really male dominated and it was all catered to the west at that time the male and female ratio in the space it was about 90 percent male it was really hard to find female because even if you are a female they will all uh, be afraid to show that their identity a few times when i when i accidentally like showed my identity people would call me out for it they will kick me out of the group they will laugh at me make fun of me and then or else they would just talk like really guy things to make me uncomfortable so that i would leave the group things like that and i do see that you know if this is the future if this is something that we are heading towards to we should all be inclusive and be open to you know have more women in the space because i couldn't find a platform where i feel belonged into the group i started my own so this is how asian was formed and as an asian woman myself this is why i started the collection featuring the asian cultures and women in the space and because of that i managed to get a lot of my friends around me to get into nfts just because the nft that we created were really beautiful and it's and some of them do look like them and we had really uh, like different traits to to choose from as well so that was kind of the story how I started um, of course as I said I, I had a business earlier on and yeah I just decided that I just needed to focus on something and, and, and I chose Asian basically that's amazing I didn't know the previous part of the story I heard about how you started but I didn't know you yeah, had a bubble out. tea business yeah I did. so <laughs> after after I graduated from school this was three years ago yeah I came back to Malaysia after um, before the pandemic there was this whole bubble tea craze uh, in Malaysia we only had about a few stores that were selling um, like Sing Tang, I'm not sure if you guys know Sing Tang, but they were like queuing like crazy every day and I saw the opportunity that in the in the more rural not like uh, urban areas um, there wasn't any bubble tea stores and that is where I started to just I didn't create it it was like a franchise but I opened a uh, source yeah so wow. that was yeah I just saw the opportunity there and I just started that business so I was drinking a lot of Very tea. Cool. I, was, I was gaining so much weight and it was just unhealthy overall because each time I visit the store, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have one cup each time I visit. So even though I put like zero sugar, it's still really fattening because it's like tapioca pull. Yeah, I gained so yep. much weight. It's like a bad investment then. Well, you lost it all. I lost it all wow. right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, brown sugar bubble tea is, is really good. Like, fun. Was it really popular in Hong Kong? Like, oh, it's like really popular. Yeah, it's still... There's like tiger sugar. I'm not sure if you guys have that. 
in Taiwan. It's like it's huge. They are they are like really really famous. Oh, it's yeah, it's huge here. Maybe a different brand. Um, it's like another wave. Yeah, but then right now the wave has kind of changed. So everybody's going through like fruit teas now, and like fruit teas yeah. or like yogurt drinks and stuff. Yep, yep, that's there too. Yeah, the the fruit fruit teas, which which is good. It's trying to be slightly healthier, which probably still has a lot of sugar, but yes, it's all filled with sugar. Yeah, but it's good. Must be a lot of that in LA too, right? So yeah, like teas and and different. Yeah, I was snacks actually thinking stuff. during the. I mean, we're still in a pandemic, but a few months ago, time is crazy. But a few months ago, the craze was bubble tea, like popsicle ice creams. Do you guys have that? Whoa. They were like in popsicle form, but it's ice cream, and this stuff was selling out. People would post on social media, "Hurry, this place, you know, Ranch Ninety Nine has it right now. Hurry!" But like that was also a craze too. And now I actually see it at Costco. Um, I don't know if you guys have Costco; it's like a big warehouse store, so they have that. But yeah, there's. I was like, "Oh my gosh, they have it!" So that was a huge wave. But yeah, there's a lot of different incredible like food opportunities here. I mean, if if you love to eat, I love to eat. I mean, LA is a great place to be because you can get a lot of different types of cuisine and a lot of different price points too. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna head to LA in in two weeks, so I'll be there for the summer actually. Um, between oh. LA and New York. So yeah, looking forward Wait, I'll to actually go be there in again. New York next week. I'll be there for <laughs> yes, NFT we'll NYC be... yeah, on the 16th to awesome. 27. So if you are ever there, do hit me up <laughs> and oh, go get bubble tea. I would tea. love to. I know I would love to, but I'm gonna miss that that period in New York. Would have would have planned I'll send it. I'll some photos. But New York's fun, yeah. And uh, you, yeah, you've been going to all the NFT conferences. You just came back from the Paris one, and yeah, next, in two weeks you go in New York. So that's quite amazing. You you speaking at the New York um, NFT conference as well? No, not really. Because this time I feel that I don't want to make it into like a work. I want to be the guest, enjoy all the uh, facilities and all the food, you know. So For I sure. think yeah, <laughs> I'll just go there and, totally. and just walk around Times Square, take some photos, do some shopping. Yeah. Yeah, I miss it. It's been well during pandemic, so two and a half years haven't traveled, and so finally can go to LA and we have family in New York. So we're gonna visit them with our little kid, and so that'll be quite fun. I mean, speaking of food, I mean, Sylvia, you, you mentioned about cooking earlier, um, and I know you cook quite a lot. Gosh, I mean, you know, I think this is like one of the things that fills my cup. I really like exploring different recipes. And because I'm in California, I'm very, very fortunate that we have access to a lot of different fruits. And so I really love eating fresh fruits and vegetables, especially seasonally, and just to be a little more eco-friendly and earth conscious. But yeah, there's just wonderful opportunities to create. And I love cooking. I love eating. <laughs> I still haven't gone out to very many restaurants because of the mix. So I have been doing a lot of cooking at home. But it's definitely something that's kind of like meditation for me. And I really feel like, you know, food is such a love language in I think Asian culture generally speaking that it really makes me feel connected to like my family if that makes sense so yeah there are definitely times when you know if I was feeling like kind of down I just go to Ranch 99 kind of walk around <laughs> I feel a little bit better no for sure it's the comfort right of course it's what you're familiar what you love you know it goes back to the taste smell and everything that comforts yourself yeah, right so absolutely absolutely <laughs> i do want to circle back you know because we mentioned about representation as well i do want to ask you know how do we think we can have more involvement with asian culture in the film industry maybe not just for actors but for everyone else what, what are some of the things we can do to support that's a great point i think that there having screen visibility is one thing but i think having people working behind the scenes is just as if not more important because for example the episode that was on Grey's Anatomy about Asian hate that was written by Lee Wong and if she hadn't written that episode and you know pushed for that subject to be addressed you know then I wouldn't have been able to be a part of that so I think it's so huge to have producers directors writers behind the scenes as well and you know a lot you know just more representation in terms of different members of the crew in order to get these stories told because it's a long journey for a story to get told if that makes sense the increase in that to happen and there's great organizations out there like for example Cape they have this incredible writers program I believe Julie actually came from that program before she got her job at Greg's Anatomy. And so, you know, they have different training programs. They have all these incredible things to support Asians in the industry. And so that's really exciting. And I think these groups are really doing a lot of good work to provide people with opportunities that they may not have had access to before. Awesome, for sure. Definitely, um, as you said, it's just in all the positions, right? Like if we can get just more representation. And I think it helps seeing on screen because then it, you know, inspires 
all roles, right? Like whether it's on screen, behind the scenes, you know, I can have seen my career go in a certain way. So it just kind of lifts up everyone uh, in all, all the areas. Um, and, you know, as producers, I mean, we from film, uh, short films and feature, uh, it is definitely what we've been working towards, right? For a few, for the past few years, uh, 10 years actually, that to keep going at it, right? And keep bringing stories and uh, have representation in different ways, uh, whether it's, you know, direct story about Asians, Asian American or nuances in, onto the screen. So yeah, I think it's great that, now a lot more people are seeing it and a lot more people would want to either get into it or help. And I think for the audience too, right? Just people get more excited and just, you know, you vote with your dollar. You go see the film, you go see the, the program, you go, you know, watch it on TV to increase the ratings. And so I think that that's all very important as well. Yeah, absolutely. Can I actually ask you as well, have you seen a change over the years that you've been working behind the scenes? Has there been an increase in diversity or an increase in nuance and stories? Yeah, uh, I mean, totally. Between, you know, from 10 years ago to now, I think definitely see an uh, increase in, in terms of the story. And I think people being more bold about writing, writing different nuances to it. I'm based in Hong Kong, but we work in Asia and in uh, the States. So we shoot in LA and New York before. So kind of see different angles of different Asian culture approach it and how different storylines are written. So um, I think it's definitely very encouraging. I mean, of course, in Asia, we have Asian representation. So how the stories are approached are a little different, but there are also nuances there that people add in, add in other stories, different issues into to it and let's see and it's not just about or anywhere i guess not just about triads right you got other stories to talk about and then yeah and the states we, you know we're, we're universal stories but bring in a lot more asian representation so yeah we definitely see that i mean my partner derek uh, he writes a lot all the stories and we see a lot more uh support whether it's from crew other casts or just generally people cheering us on quite good to see that that's really interesting. Actually, my favorite show, I don't really watch a lot of shows, but I really like the movie Crazy Rich Asian. Um, I love how they wore baju kebaya, which is one of the Malaysian heritage uh, traditional clothing. And I'm a huge fan of mahjong as well. I love to play mahjong growing up. Uh, my grandma played mahjong and I learned from her. And in the movie, they were playing mahjong. After that movie, um, a lot of people started playing mahjong movies do play a huge part in shaping like the society culture uh, cultures you know this is why it's really important to make sure that our roots and heritage are always being featured and shown so that our kids and all the young people like my friends and myself will, won't forget all these traits and stories behind it absolutely so definitely looking forward to see more in different contents, different forms and different regions. And I mean, with that, I, I thank you, Sylvia, for joining. Um, and want to see if there's any uh, words of advice uh, or last words you want to impart on the listeners and Nicole as well. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been such a great conversation. Thank you guys so much for having me. I think just even talking to you both with what you guys are doing, the same kind of like struggles and Basically, the bottom line is we're more similar than we are different in terms of humanity, right? Like, I think no matter what space you're in, no matter what industry you're in, just people in general have more things in common and enjoy things about different cultures. You know, people are people. We all have our own struggles. We all want to be seen. We all want to be heard. And, you know, we all want kind of the same things. So that's, I think, the message that I would like to leave with. And thank you guys so much for having me here. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I would love to have a separate talk to talk about pre NFT and get you on board into the space. <laughs> yeah, is... I'd love to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. For sure. That sounds great. And thank you so much to both of you and uh, everyone who listened in. Um, and stay tuned for the next episode.